sit by her feet and pick up the little straps that she would draw. And I started coming to the market with her at the age of eight. And I've been making baskets for over 20 years now. Thanks to my Aunt Linda. And Linda, oh my God, she was the teacher. I could get all the way to the top of a basket and if it was wrong at the bottom, she'd make me take the whole basket down and do it over. But now that's a good thing because everybody likes my baskets. The baskets, it signified Charles. This is a, a heritage. It's been squashed a little, it's been kicked around, but it's a culture that's been always been hanging around and it's, and it's refusing to move. Well, the hardest part for me is trying to get the loops all the same size. <laughs> but other than that, it's pretty much simple and easy. I'm working with um, sweet grass, bull rush, that's the harder material, the darker one, pine needles, and then the wrapping is the palmetto. And we just do that different for coloring. Um, and then the bull rush is a thicker material, so that makes the basket a little harder and make it firmer. I love it here because you know I, I'm in contact with a lot of people. I meet more people here than I did when I was on Highway 17. And, uh, I meet people from all over the world. Uh, I have baskets all over the world. <laughs> Pictures of me all over the world. <laughs> yeah. It opens up into a fan, deep like that. That's how it leaves them out. <clears throat> well, this is a fan. You strip it down piece by piece, and you strip, make little tiny strips out of it. First, you take off the rough edges, and you can strip pile metal into any sizes that you want. I like a nice medium size, so that you can use it to insert your back. And to start a, a bottom, I usually use long leaf pine needles because it's soft and easier to bend. And I twist, make a knot in the center of the pine needles, pull it tight, cut the heads off. First I put the nail bone. We use this as a bone. It's a the old Tradition is using the bone of an animal, but today we just use an old spoon, teaspoon, or, and then we just grind it down with a nice smooth point on it, and we use this as our bone. We still call it bone from the old tradition. Of it. You're the first person I've seen who put his uh, nail bone around his neck. That's another thing I invented. That's to show that you won't lose it. So it'll always be right on you at all times. Because doing it any other way is you always have to drop it. And sometimes you just don't know where you drop it. Especially when you get busy with people who can't find your nail bone. And the carpenter is no good without his hammer. Okay, now this is neat. I like this piece. Linda did this. Linda Hugie. She did this piece. And it started from just an ordinary fanner. We had some peas, some cow peas or some rice and just place it toward the wind and just get your product back into this. It's from a work basket to a piece of art. When you think of baskets today, you think of something decorative to be placed in your home or a china cabinet or wherever, but historically, uh, baskets were utilitarian. Along with the rice production and, and the whole arrival of Africans into the New World came the basket and the whole genre of making that basket. Really, it's a part of the rice culture. Uh, wintering baskets, fanning baskets, 
or were all part of the process that African and African Americans made in the early part of our nation's history to produce rice. That craft, that know-how, that gift, that talent has been passed on from generations to generations. The basket making tradition is something that thrives within families. It's, it's passed on from mother to daughter, father to son, and the families that have these traditions have historically taken great, great pride in the perpetuation of this tradition. And it's been recognized as an element of African craft making. Now it seems like a lot more people are getting back into it, but the problem is not material because it's very difficult to find the material now. You know, they used to find sweet grass all over Charleston County. Um, I mean, where I grew up, you, you could just step out of my house and you can find just a few hundred yards from the house, you can find them. But, you know, because of the development and all that now on the coasts, it's very difficult to find. I actually harvest the grass, sweet grass. I usually go. Um, further south of 95, um, near Buford, Bluffton area. Um, there's still good many sweet grass growing up there, growing there um, on some private property. You can get permission to go in and get them. Um, this past summer, my brother and I were going out to harvest some sweet grass, and because you know, there was this one area that we went, we were going to for, for quite some time, for several years, we used to go to every summer. This past summer we went there and the whole thing was bulldozed over down. Somebody was building a new house. I mean, we were like phew, devastated, you know. I remember saying to him, you know, that's progress for you. Sweet grass is going away. But uh, there's no doubt about it, it is. I mean, it's not a hype. I mean, it is getting very, very difficult to, to find the sweet grass. These native plants are being replaced by non-natives constantly and we're losing our sense of place, we're losing habitat. I started growing it at home and actually started growing it, you know, as a nursery crop. I mean, grow thousands every year in gallon pots and, and sell them and it grows very well and I've had good success propagating it. But it's mostly been planted as an ornamental, which is great, I mean, it perpetuates the plant and, and maybe it is being planted in places that can be harvested. I think. Um, I sold a lot to the city of Charleston. They planted all along Lockwood mm -hmm. Boulevard yeah, Lockwood there. Drive, right. And it's right next to the marsh and it's pretty tough. And you know, I don't know if anybody's harvested that, but I would imagine yeah. it'd be pretty good grass. They have. They have. It can be over harvested. And that's one thing I talk about. I say, you know, well, somebody was just here, so I don't know how much. And that's also why I try to show people some other areas. So everyone's not harvesting from the same spot um, and try to get new plots started. and and managed and by their pulling it actually helps the grass. I, I look to the basket makers to basically manage or, or farm the grass by doing that because otherwise it's just going to choke itself out. And our owners who plant it in their landscapes, it's, it's still good for the baskets because it's on the same soil. And I tell them, you know, if you want your grass to keep living, you need to have it pulled. Um, so many of them have said, they've, you know, please tell them come pull it. We have no problem with that. This is the, the mature sweetgrass plant. It's a bunch grass, so as you can see, the growth form literally forms a tussock or a bunch right through here. It grows out. This is a mature plant. And this is, from what I understand, what the ladies use to collect and they pull it out right here. It's the time of year they collect it. Uh, like I said, you do not find this in the interior. The shade seems to be a factor. I've tried uh, a pilot study where I looked at light as a potential factor governing where it can grow, and it needs to have quite a bit of full sunlight. It doesn't move down into the salt marsh, too salty down there. It can't move in, so this is just this thin little band. 
in which it occurs, and it only occurs along the coast, basically from the North Carolina, Virginia area, down through parts of Florida, jumps over to the Gulf Coast, and over to Texas. So There's a very thin strip of where this plant can actually occur. When my kids was little, we used to take them on Sunday evening, just to show them where we pull grass at. So you planted this uh, how long ago? Last year. The first day when you let it dry, it'd be like a greenish color. Then if you let it stay out there another day, it turned a little whiter. Then about the third day, it turned to a nice pretty golden brown. I lay down some tin because when the sun hits it, it gets hot. Mm -hmm. So in two days, mine's already cured. And then you just bundle it up tie it up, put it in a nice dry place, and it lasts for years until time to use it. The, the quality of the work for most basket weavers are better, in my opinion now, than they were back in my mom's days when I was a little girl growing up. I pursued a career in teaching. I taught school for 30 years. Of course, I couldn't have, I didn't have the time to sew then, but I knew if and when I retired, that would be a way of supplementing my retirement income. So after retiring, I began making basket. And I truly do enjoy it. There was always more than one income in the family. Uh, my dad uh, was a merchant seaman. Uh, he was military before then. My brothers, uh, they were older. My brother and sisters were older, so they worked. There were always uh, more than one income when I was coming up. But when my siblings were much younger, um, they saw a lot of hardship because there was only the one income in the family, and it just wasn't enough. This is an art right here. You know, every, everybody can't do this. But this is an art. And it's been handed down from generation to generation to generations, you know. This is something that our ancestors left to us. We can't just let it go just like that. Without a fight, I'll put it that way. visited some of the basket making stands and one of the things that I observed immediately was the level of noise from the increased traffic, uh, the amount of debris and dust and the pollution from the, just the traffic that's going by. So it, it's not comfortable but they may do, you know, I mean they're fighters, they're survivors. I think it's also important that we look at the communities where the basket makers live. Uh, most of those communities are still pretty much rural. You don't find the big fancy homes that you find in the subdivisions. And the basket makers are quite comfortable with that. That is their heritage and they want to hold on to it. Uh, in many cases, a lot of the people who have migrated to this area came here because of that country atmosphere. 
And right now there are many people who are trying to get rid of that and displace those basket makers in those communities. And I think it's very important that we work very hard to try and preserve those communities. I think also that our, our elected officials, Mount Pleasant Town Council and Charleston County Council, that they should be looking at drafting ordinance and legislation that would be designed to protect the sweetgrass basket making industry. Uh, the town of Mount Pleasant has already started that and I would like to see Charleston County do the same thing. I believe that uh, it's going to be a long, hard battle. It's not going to be easy, but I think the uh, means for us to accomplish the goal of um, preserving these communities certainly can be done. Start off with a certain style in your mind, and a little later on, as you weave, you'll probably deviate from that and do something else. So that pretty much could happen with every time when you weave. And I'm hearing the rest of the weavers say the same thing. As time goes, you know, as you weave, you um, think of a style as you weave. So according to the the work that you put in the basket, what kind of design that you're going to use. And uh, then like that, I come up with the price as for the labor and the material of the basket. When someone is spending hundreds of dollars or whatever they spend on a basket, they learn the quality. A lot of bas a lot of people who collect it have learned the quality. What to look for when they buy a basket. You look for a symmetrical pattern. It has to be tightly woven. You want the coiling to be not very, very thick. You want it to be medium or small. If you're making something like jewelry, it's extra small, real small. I think it should be a focal point with the young people more so than my generation because this is what's going to hold this art together is the next generation. And all the respect for this basket, it does not reflect me and anything that I do publicly or, or in the community or any way I have traveled, it never reflects just me. It reflects my entire community and the older basket makers who really need to, the one that's still alive to show some great appreciation for them because they're the, our fathers or mothers who taught us this wonderful art and we cannot forget them. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. like the, the little sewing basket my mom made, even the one with the handles or a cross. And I appreciate my grandmother when she always used to make a uh, trash basket, she used to call it, all the time. I watch her do it and I watch her do it over and over. And she make it the same way every time. I've been working on this for over a week now and I'm still got a long way to go. Some days I work seven hours, some days I don't work any hours. But it just takes a long time, and when I'm tired, I don't work on it, because I want to keep the same perfectionist on the basket. Uh, if you're too tired, you, you don't do a good job. You have a little, make a lot of mistakes. So when I get tired, I just take a break, and then I come back to it. Or if I get tired with the same design or working on this piece, then I go to something else. Take it out. Put this 
is inside there to make the hole. It's an interesting irony, the success that Sweetgrass Baskets have had. They are in people's collections. They adorn living spaces. They adorn museums and gallery collections. And at the same time, it is sad that many of the places that basket makers have gone to harvest and to pull much of the products to make these baskets are not available um, to them. And that many of the communities that they are coming from are really being challenged um, in terms of development. So it's an ironic fate we find ourselves in um, here in the Low Country. But I think by and large, it is an exciting um, time for basket makers and basket making when we can show the world this rich, rich, rich heritage. I was a registered nurse. I retired in 1997, May 1997. And um, started making baskets full time um, on the highway in 97. And that's where I am now, making baskets. And my daughter, my oldest daughter, um, came and she liked what I was doing and she said, you know, you have the computer, why don't we um, set up a website? And we talked about it for almost a year. And finally, in the beginning of 1997, my oldest son was working for a gentleman who was a photographer. So I paid him his money and he made that, took the initial pictures, I've added to it since, but that's when it started. And it's gotten better every year because I put new stuff on. I take stuff that's not selling well, I take it off and put on some of the newer baskets. And it's been moving right along. I think it's remarkable that this traditional practical craft that had its origin in the development of plantations, which was so devastated to the people of Africa, should today become symbolic of South Carolina and something that all South Carolinians can take pride in. I think it reflects the emergence of culture as something that is increasingly or potentially capable of rising above the legacy of the past and reflecting something new and something different and something more hopeful. To me, the basket represents, it represents continuity and change. And as a historian, that's really important if you're trying to examine something to, to look at changes, what it has meant to a group of people, to understand the impact it's had on a group or on the nation. So as a historian, that's important because it, uh, it allows us to glimpse at a world in the past and the present and to look at connections uh, and to look for continuities and changes. And the basket is almost like an icon. When I think about it as an African-American woman, um, I collect baskets and I collect pottery. And so for me, it takes on another different life. It's an object of, of just beauty, and, and it's something that I enjoy looking at. There's something that is very, very obvious about sweetgrass. Whenever you go to a luxury resort, whatever you see uh, nice housing develops put in and people are restoring and trying to beautify their neighborhoods, one of the things they put out there is sweetgrass. They're starting to identify sweetgrass with Charleston, with Charleston, with South Carolina. Now, where are they getting material? In some cases, they're getting from local growers. We do have people that have collected material originally from Dewey's Island, Capers Island, stuff along John's Island. And they grow this and they sell it commercially, which is great. on a collection basket. This is actually an original design. Not to my knowledge that anyone has ever done any, anything like this. And you pass the basket around on collection and they slot, put the money right into the 
largest slots. The basket, I think it has drawn me closer to keeping the culture alive. Because if you don't take care of anything, it becomes extinct. If you don't nurture it or take care of it or you don't know the history about it, it's gone. Oh, Lord, yeah. Oh, Lord, yeah. Oh, Lord, yeah.